because the Corolla has that limitation with engine bay, that's why uh, in the in the current car we use a four cylinder engine, and it's all aluminum and really lightweight to try to get the least amount of weight up front and the most power dense package. To push the piston down and make power, it's actually pushing up on the cylinder head. And what we found is it was deflecting the chamber, and like the cylinder head Whoa. would flex Whoa. up. And it didn't matter how well you had it bolted down, in between the bolts, it would flex it would up. flex? Yep. Whoa. So on that engine... How do we... you discover that? <clears throat> What's up, folks? Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Viore. I love my Viore shirts. I'm wearing one right now. I got the Viore shorts for when I work out. I got the Viore hoodies. I cleaned that place out using my 20% off my first... Uh, purchase discount. These shirts are great. When I found these things and I bought my first one, I knew that it was the last shirt I ever wanted to wear. And I threw away 90% of my other shirts and replaced them with Viore. All these shirts and shorts and pants are designed to work out in, but they don't look or feel like it. They're so comfortable. You want to wear it all the time, whether you're going to work, whether you wear it under a nice shirt when you're going out, whether you're going to yoga or going jogging. It's super versatile. It can be used for any activity. And it's just special. I don't know what it is about the strato fabric in their t-shirts, but when I wear them, you can't see sweat. And when it's hot out in California and I'm working up on the mountain in the desert, I got to stand in front of a camera, but then I got to work around a hot car and then I got to get in a hot car and I'm super self-conscious about feeling sweaty. And so these shirts hide sweat. It's great. It's designed to look great in everyday life for any workout activity. The website is super easily laid out, easy to use, and they are true to size, which I, I really like that. The double XL fits me perfectly. They're really dark. Durable. They last a long time. I've washed them a million times, and uh, they are great. The best-selling products are that men's core short, which is what I wear when I uh, use the elliptical machine at home or do Pilates, and then the Sunday performance jogger. That is the perfect Zach Clapman pant. It's like a non-jeans. It's like athletic technical fabric, right? You wear them when you're, like, hiking or something. Or you can just wear it all the time. Viore is an investment in your happiness. And for our listeners, they are offering 20% off your first purchase. Get yourself some of the most comfortable and versatile clothing on the planet at viore.com slash TST. That's V-U-O-R-I dot com slash TST. Not only will you receive 20% off your first purchase, but enjoy free shipping on any U.S. orders over $75 and free returns. Viore.com slash TST, V-U-O-R-I dot com slash TST, and discover the versatility of Viore clothing. Also brought to you today by Off the Record. We love Off the Record. They do a much, much needed service to the community. You know why? Because policing is not about keeping roads safe. It's about raising revenue and creating a revenue generating ecosystem for the police departments, the courts, and insurance companies at your expense. Never plead guilty. If you get pulled over and get a ticket, offtherecord.com slash TST or download the Off The Record app and use code TST10. That will get you 10% off all legal services from Off The Record. Off The Record are not lawyers. What they do is they connect you to a qualified lawyer in the area where you got that ticket They'll fight that ticket on your behalf, working to get those points off your record. And that's really important because it's one thing to just, if it was just paying a one-time fine, that would be one thing, but that's not what these tickets are. There's the fines, there's the court costs, and then there's the insurance companies that raise your rates possibly for as long as several years, meaning a ticket that you think is like $200 could really cost you thousands of dollars in the long term. Don't be a sucker, don't plead guilty, offtherecord.com slash TST or code TST10 on the Off The Record app. Get it now and be ready instead of having to think about this from the side of the road. All right, folks, today on the program, Stefan Papadakis is in studio. This guy was a multi-record-breaking front-wheel drive drag racer, first Honda in the nines, 
eights, sevens, and sixes, and is now uh, the owner and uh, team principal at Papadakis Racing, which manages three Formula Drift cars, including the championship-winning uh, Frederick Osbo, all driving Toyota GR products. We talk about Formula Drift, the B58 engine, and whether it lives up to the reputation and standards set by the 2JZ, his amazing RAV4 off-road product project car, the state of the Formula Drift industry, uh, some some really cool uh, innovations in tuning and drag racing, and a whole lot more. Stefan Papadakis on the Smoking Tire Podcast. That's really funny. I had that was the kind of thing that I thought about when I was like 16. I learned to drive manual on cars with V8s, right? Just at the time, there was like some Fox body Mustangs and my dad had a Corvette and that's what I learned to drive stick on, right? And 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 I would, you know, when they taught me to drive stick, they'd say, oh, upshift at like 3,000 RPM or something, right? But then I bought a Subaru and it was like a five-speed Subaru Legacy GT and on the highway, it would be revving at like four in fifth gear. <laughs> this is so embarrassing, but I literally called the dealer thinking something was wrong with the car because it was like, I was like, it's revving too high. They're like, shut up, kid. What are you talking about? This is how it is. It was so dumb. But I, it's a funny thing for someone, especially the founder of to be worried about. It's like, no, well, it goes to almost 10, man. Like, it's like not even halfway. Right, as a percentage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's uh, like we're speaking now. Okay, so. cool. Um, but that's a funny thing. And so, does he not care about the about the other cars? It's just that car that bothers him. I think he cares about all the cars in some way. But for whatever reason, he's uncomfortable on the freeway with the RPMs high, and is now considering re-gearing it. Oh, and I'm like, dude, the whole point of the car is to have fun in the canyons. Like yeah. it's going to be more fun with the, you know, the How the short funny. gears. But that's I mean, that's just people's quirks, right? Like. Regearing an S2000 so it doesn't have to rev is a very funny thing to think about. I, I, I would argue that maybe Honda could have done a better job with a little bit. If you're not, you're not using six gear racing around. Yeah, so yeah. So you might as well just turn it into like cruiser gear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I support that. And when we regeared my uh, Boxster Spider, we left sixth alone. So you can go, you know, normal speed at normal revs and you're not. I drove that Sharkworks car. Uh, they had a GT4, and they re-geared all of it, one through sixth, 4,900 RPM at fucking 75 miles an hour. The thing was, like, screaming. It was miserable. I didn't like it at all. Then maybe that's what JC's talking about, yeah. buddy John, is but it's just stock. he doesn't like that feeling, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. there's a vibration going through the car that you're sure. just like, that's not comfortable to cruise around. It's not a cruiser. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I assume somebody makes a gear set for that car, right? Uh, somebody must. Yeah. I don't know. Who I never looked know? into it. There's a shop we know down here that's doing a Civic Type R engine in a S2000, which I think would be pretty cool, actually. Yeah, I've actually been looking into fun stuff to, and then try to getting a Bard here. And that, yeah. that's, oh, the, yeah. that's the challenge. Like it's, it's kind of it would be kind of fun to say well, what en what chassis do I really like and what engine do I really like, and mm -hmm. then do the installation and, and in a way that you can take it and get it uh, certified to be totally smog legal yeah. in California. I think you probably could do it with a stock Civic Type R engine if you left the cats and stuff and. That'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. So what's going on? How's life? Good. Yeah. So what have you been up to? Um, all the the drift stuff. So we're yeah. you know, busy with all the drift competitions. Um, How many cars are you running this year? We're going to run three. Okay. Yeah. So we want run the defending two-time defending champion, uh, Frederick Osbo, mm -hmm. and a GR Supra. Um, all the drift stuff, meaning you guys won last year, right? Yeah. We, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we we run um, yeah Frederick Osbo's car mm -hmm. when we work with Toyota and Rockstar Energy Drink and Nato Tire and, and uh, other sponsors. Who decides what chassis they run? Toyota or does Frederick get to choose? Uh, he was running like a hatchback for a while. Yeah, Toyota. So we started okay. with uh, Toyota. We we started with Scion, mm -hmm. and they're like, hey, we you know we we're running this Scion TC, mm -hmm. and we worked with you know Tanner Faust, and right. we built the first generation TC, the NASCAR motor, right? It was it for Turbo Four, and then it was a NASCAR motor, the other way around, it was the other way around. Okay, yeah. So they were, they said just use the chassis, and we're like, all right, we're gonna make a real drive, obviously for drift, yeah. but we want to use this NASCAR V8 that you guys are using, and uh, they're like, well, we don't. 
I mean, this is Scion. We sell the cars. Like we market you also the cars. Sell like we don't front wheel drive cars. Yeah, <laughs> but then the folks at Scion in corporate, in the executive level, they didn't really deal with the NASCAR people because that's TRD and they're in Costa Mesa sure, building the engines. Right. Um, so made a couple phone calls and able to link them. And then uh, at that time, uh, NASCAR. Well, Toyota was so successful in the truck program with their new V8 that when they find NASCAR finally allowed Toyota to run. Uh, in the Cup Series, they said you can run your engine in Cup, but you have to make all these different changes that made it a little bit less competitive. Mm. And so all these older truck engines, what they call the Phase Nine engine, became obsolete, and they started trickling down to a bunch of different motorsport. So you're seeing them in short course off road and like the. Um, is that, that? And is a production based Tundra motor? Not one bit. Okay. Not one bit. All so right. it's a push rod, uh, ninety degree V eight. Okay. Um, with overhead valves. And is, you know, if you want to race NASCAR, you got to like, I don't even know how to build this. Like, <laughs> like, can we get some Americans on the team? Because like, I don't know how to make this thing. <laughs> you know what's interesting is you take a, a tour through the Costa Mesa engine building facility where they you design and build and everything these the V8s for the NASCAR program. There's a there's a couple of Japanese folk there, but it's mostly Americans yeah. and British. Yeah, coming and from British. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. they're international because some of the best engineers from motorsport, I think mm. they pull them from, from Formula One and stuff. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that makes exactly. sense. That's funny. It's like it's like a step backwards for them a little bit, but making good power, so whatever. Well, I think that's, I would argue that part of the interesting things of uh, going racing is, okay, here's a set of rules. Mm -hmm. Now figure out how to beat everybody with the same set of rules. Sure. And whatever it is, maybe it's overhead valve and old V8. Te ar architecture, but they would take modern technology and modern uh, material science and, and and engineering and put it into this old architecture and make you know huge amount of power with tons of RPM and and have, make it reliable. Sure. And so back to the Scion and 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 so so and actually interesting question. You've got now you've got GR and and you've got TRD. So where are your drift cars? pulling things from? Is it both or one or the other? Or how is Toyota dealing with the existence of GR and TRD as relates to your motorsport? Yeah, so we work with uh, the, the GR program okay. because the GR uh, has, in here in the U.S., has the GR Supra, which we run with yeah. Frederick Osbo. They have a GR Corolla, which we run with uh, Ryan Turk, and they have a GR86 that we run with uh, Jonathan Castro. Okay. So we're essentially, uh, I think... Internally at, at Toyota, um, I mean, it, it seems as though GR is focusing toward the younger demographic, and that demographic follows drift more than probably NASCAR and other other things. Yeah, and seems like TRD is trucks. Is they're moving to trucks more? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't have any official, you know, things. No, I don't, that yeah, they, I don't yeah. Either, yeah. But but that seems like you know what they're doing. Is there? How different are the cars underneath your race cars, or is it is it is it underneath all kind of the same thing with bo production bodies laid on them? So with Formula Drift rules, they have to be very much based on the factory unibody, and there's only certain areas that you're allowed to modify. So, like for instance, the GR Supra is a GR Supra with the B58 inline six cylinder engine that we you know rebuild and make. 1200 horsepower with a larger turbocharger and nitrous and all this other stuff. Um, and the suspension is from a company called WiseFab, but it bolts to the factory cross members, which have to be utilized with the rules. So it's a full on competition drift car, but it is absolutely based and has a lot of the factory components in it. Is that how do those rules apply when you're talking about, say, the Corolla, where you're going from a transverse type powertrain to a pure rear wheel drive, I assume longitudinal powertrain. Yeah, so we still have the factory unibody, but they allow uh, you to cut the center of it for bell housing clearance. Okay. Because when you turn the engine, you know, 90 degrees, so yeah, the, the, the output is going right. toward the rear, yeah. you know, you have the gearbox and the bell housing and everything. Sure. So they allow, there's a template that you're allowed to cut the firewall and re-sheet metal uh, the center of the car oh, to okay. allow that clearance. Yeah. Uh, but the suspension is the same general uh, design so it's a front McPherson uh, with the stock front cross member and then we're allowed to do whatever we want on the suspension uh, arms and bits mm -hmm. so uh, we fabricate our own control arms spindles um, 
hubs and all of that, and then RSR makes us a couple a custom set of uh, suspension for it. So, is there an advantage or a disadvantage in? Okay, you have to go with the Supra architecture, but you can change the things that bolt to the pickup points versus you can turn this, you know, powertrain now, which allows you to build a little more and make some more custom stuff, but at the same time, you've got to make more custom stuff. So would you rather have the, 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 the flexibility of what to build and put there, or would you rather be, have to work within an already pretty good chassis? I'd rather work with an already pretty good chassis mm. for two reasons. Number one, we, we're not allowed within the rules to move the engine farther back than the factory firewall location. Mm. So even though we're making clearance for the bell housing and the transmission, we can't set the engine back. And when right. you're dealing with a Corolla or a front-wheel drive car, these are cab four design yeah, vehicles. Yeah, not much room there. Yeah, mm. and the firewall is only eight inches rearward of the front axle center line. So, you know, if you imagine a line that for your front axle, where it would be that, and it, so only eight inches, assuming you have zero right. engine to firewall clearance, is behind the front axle. The rest of that engine is in front of the front axle, and that hurts rear rear traction for and rear sure. grip. And, and so the Supra has a much farther back um, firewall. So because the Corolla has that limitation with engine bay, that's why uh, in, the, in the current car we use a four-cylinder engine and it's all aluminum and really lightweight to try to get the least amount of weight up front and the most power dense package. Sure. Is that a production based engine? Yeah, it's called the 2ARFE engine. So 2000, uh, what would that be like? All the 2.5 liter and 2.7 liter four cylinders, like a 2014 Toyota Camry or a RAV4 oh, yeah, or yeah. the second generation t Scion mm -hmm. TC all came with that engine. Okay. Very. Uh, very good base engine if you do a ton of work to it like we what we do, but almost no aftermarket support. Mm -hmm. So it's all in house. Yeah, I mean we we use the factory block, we use the factory cylinder head, but we uh, you know billet crankshaft, rods, pistons, different head gasket setup, bolts. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a factory head. It is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What about that? Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's tough. Yeah, the, the limitation that we found on that engine uh, is the head gaskets would blow, yeah. and we ended up with really big head bolts, head studs, so it, you know, so it doesn't want to stretch the bolts, and then you, you do a really strong head gasket so it doesn't want to blow, but what we found ends up happening is just like you, know, you want a lot of power and combustion um, to push the piston down and make power, it's actually pushing up on the cylinder head, and what we found is it was deflecting the chamber and like the cylinder head Whoa. would flex Whoa. up, and it didn't matter how well you had it bolted down, in between the bolts, it would flex it would flex? up. flex? Yep. Whoa. So on that engine- How do we, you discover that? With the areas that- Where it burns it was, the gasket is like in the middle? Yep. Wow, Yep. that's fucking crazy. And then you start looking apart. We actually cut some cylinder heads apart to see what the cross-sectional thickness were mm. in the areas that it was breaking, and we're like, this is so thin. Like it's a piece of, if you had a piece of, you know, it's not sheet metal, but like it's only like a couple hundred thousands thick. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what we end up doing now is we run studs through the middle, through the middle of it, <laughs> down through the water passage, and it supports that uh, that deck surface there. That's so Holy interesting shit. that that actually like works. Yeah. Now is that something? I mean, you have to use the stock head, or you're using the stock head. If you if that's if that head was made of a different type of alloy, or if you got a different head that was designed differently that still worked, is that an option for you, or is it like you have to run the stock head on the stock block because of regulations? We're allowed to run a custom one, or a billet one, or a custom okay. casted one, but the cost and everything involved would be for so one high. car. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and so and plus these modern overhead cam engines, there are so many oil ports. And um, the dual cam setup, and like, there's so much machining on a cylinder head, like, and it's so intricate and complicated compared to like an overhead valve one, that it, it would be a, a monumental engineering but, nightmare, almost impossible. Okay. Compared yeah. to like bolts. Yeah, great, great, great point. I <laughs> compared never, never to like, that's incredible. Just yeah. fucking bolt it down in the middle. Like, yeah, so it's a pretty it, basic solution. Run ratchet that. straps around the thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not a foolproof design. We do still have issues once in a while. Uh, but the, 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 
if we went to a different engine, like if we put the inline six, like a two JZ or something like sure. that in the front of it, that would make more power. But and it put, would be like you'd have to cut a hole in the front bumper for the fucking thing to stick out of, probably. It would yeah. look like an old Bentley, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, with a blower the mounted on the, the front, front yeah. on the axle. Yeah. It'd be like um you know, like the Audis, yeah. where they have the radiator on the side? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like an old like quad sport quattro with the motor like way out in front. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You ever look under the hood of like a Saab 900? There's some funky shit, too. It's like way, way out in front. It's really weird. Um, so the uh, – and is the uh, the 86 is, uh, is running a 2J, though, right? Isn't that what you're using that? We run a B58 in it, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm. So that was a new car that we built uh, for Jonathan last year. And we thought about all the different engines that we wanted to use, and and honestly, for our application in drift, the B fifty eight inline six from the super, we had already developed it for Freddie's car. Yeah. So, uh, what do you have to do to make it fit? Will it just fit? We had to modify the oil pan slightly. That's not so bad. And then different engine mounts and such. Yeah. But it's pretty straightforward swap. As, huh. as much of a swap as a two JZ would have been. Right. So when when those those engines uh, first got put into Toyotas, you know, and they called it Supra, and the, the 2J is just a legendary engine and all that stuff. There was that kind of question of, will this engine over time be worthy of the reputation of the previous engine? And, and what is your take on that? For our application, I like the B58 more than the 2JZ because mm. uh, we actually have, don't have to modify it as much to make 1,000 horsepower. Um, the cylinder head already flows well. Um, uh, th- this, it's a good baseline. It's also, I think, fi- 40 or 60 pounds lighter. Uh-huh. So that helps get uh, you know some of the weight off. And um, it's- That's a good looking car. Is that up to date? That's from 2022. That's uh, yeah. That's the car he's uh, going to run again this year that it's we built for him nice last year. Very nice looking car. Yeah, that body kit is nice looking too. And if you look real close, uh, there's a bump on the hood where the fuel rail. Not everything fit under the hood because mm-hmm. we run a custom intake manifold. So there's a little bulge there above the mobile one, and uh, that's the clearance part of the engine. Okay. Yeah. So possible. I bet that car is fun. Oh, we think that car is it probably at least as competitive as the the Supra that Fredericks in. Is, is it? Good? Yeah. Is it? I mean, is it considered a, a a step back? I mean, or is that is that how the hierarchy is? Like, oh, you won the championship, so you get the Supra, and next down, or is it is like because that car? It seems like the eighty six is lighter, right? It is, it is some, lighter. It is lighter. It, but there's I, still an advantage to having the Supra because. I, Why? Um, Freddie has always been in Supras. Not always, but he's he's kind of a Supra guy. So he's always wanted to just, like his dream when he was, well, I'm going to be a race car driver and be an ambassador for Toyota okay. and, and compete in a Supra. Like that was just a dream of his. He used to and, compete in the Mark IV, right? And and also do the ice driving with it. But I think he 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 cut his teeth in FD in a, in a Mark IV, right? That's right. Yeah. Yep. And then he ended up in a Corolla, which was... Uh, you know, hey man, you got a job to do, which is let's make this Corolla cool. Yeah. And I think we did a good job at that, and we made it competitive as well. Um, we're actually, TC as well. Uh, but uh, so, uh, what ends up happening is there's a new vehicle come out, coming out, and at the time it was the GR Supra, and uh, they were Toyota was looking around for which team would run the GR and um, or the Supra, and the I, th- I think at that moment the T. I don't remember exactly how it went down, but basically we brought the GR Super onto the team and then Frederick drove that and then Frederick's old Corolla, uh, we rebuilt and everything and that's what Ryan Turk drove. Uh-huh. Um, so it was just some conversations within the team and within Toyota to what we thought was you know, the most exciting combination. Do you think, I, I mean, the, the stuff that Ryan's building is like, side projects I think is really exciting the 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 86 the Ferrari motor and he's now got this thing with this Judd V10 which I don't even know where one gets a Judd V10 but that sounds fucking pretty cool to me um is that you know that stuff that's outside of the rules of the of FD but still you know really neat and 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 attention grabbing and and sort of 
for the lulls, as it were. Do you have any interest in stuff like that, or do you just want to win and this is just what it takes? Guys, we got to take a quick break from this show because NASCAR is heading back to the East Coast and racing at Atlanta Motor Speedway. With a handful of races now under these driver's belts, the competition is starting to heat up. One of the drivers we've got our eyes on this weekend is the local Georgia product, Chase Elliott. He's one of NASCAR's most popular drivers and consistently at the top of the overall standings, but has yet to find himself in victory lane this year. Will this be his week to take home the checker and cement his spot in the 2023 NASCAR playoffs? Don't miss out on the action. Make sure you tune in to the NASCAR Cup Series race Sunday, March 19th at 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern, 12 noon Pacific on Fox. Do you have any interest in stuff like that, or do you just want to win and this is just what it takes? Uh, uh, we build a car a year. So uh, last year we built Jonathan's GR86. Uh, the year before, um, what did we build? Uh, we built a super, I think, what was that, three years ago? Um, so we'll, we'll build a car every year, but in order to build something really crazy like what Ryan does, I think you kind of need to specialize in it. And my theory is that it would take a bit away from the actual competition. Mm -hmm. And because that's our primary focus, uh, I try not to take on projects that are too ambitious. Mm -hmm. Um, that would uh, deter from our main focus, which is, you know, the competition. Yeah. Drifting is like, in my mind, it's pretty abusive on a car. And yet it seems like FD cars tend to last a pretty long time by race car standards. Yeah. I mean, we go through them a lot. Isn't that Viper still fucking running? <laughs> that Sam Hubenet <laughs> drove in like 2007? Isn't that Viper still out there? Uh, I don't, <laughs> it's not an FD. Oh, uh, I think, yeah, that'd be Dean Kearney drives Vipers. Dude, I think he's got like two or three of those things. I don't know which one's which. <laughs> but like, it seems like these cars have a longer life expectancy than a lot of race cars. Yeah. Um, and I I can't think offhand of why that would be. Uh, <laughs> like, do they have, do they have fewer know. crashes? Because, because of, I don't know, because it's not about beating someone to a position and so maybe you take a little less risk or I would say that the speeds are lower mm -hmm. so when the, the accidents do happen it's rare that you're getting a car that's totaled right because um, our most of our speeds are under 100 miles an hour uh, but you know the cars have been totaled uh, the other thing would be the slight increases of building a new car in performance slight, slight increases in performance may not justify the cost and everything to build that new car. You can just sort of update your old car. Yeah. And a lot of the guys get, you know, it's drift, man. Like it's, it's part of it. A lot of it is the show, not necessarily just the technology. So a lot of the drivers are known with their car, right. like they're the Mark IV super guy or they're the Viper guy or whatever it is. It's like wearing a costume. Totally. An outfit. Yeah. That it's makes like, It's like the monster sense. truck thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Have you ever seen the business of monster truck rallies? It's pretty wild. I was just talking to a friend about it where, like, I, I was, I don't remember the age, but at some point I, I blew my mind that there was, like, multiple Bigfoots. Yeah, right? yeah. There's, like, five <laughs> or six. And they're, <laughs> they're touring all over the country. Like, there's a Bigfoot in Minnesota right now, and there's one in Anaheim also. And, like, it doesn't really matter who's driving them. It's all about the livery of the truck. Yeah, well, but the drift is not like that. No, so the drift not. is like yeah. there's the one, there's the one driver, and we come to town. Uh, but you, you guys don't you know about the, the other Ryan Turk. There's another yeah. one right now. Yeah, <laughs> he's in Jersey right now. <laughs> so like when you built uh, Frederick Supra, and how much, how much do you change it year to year, or is that one like you said you build one car a year? So you built that completely, and then do you just iterate it in small ways every year with new regulations, or to make small improvements, or you know, while you're focusing on building the whole new GR86. Or do you sometimes have there been seasons where you go, it's perfect the way it is. We won last year. We're not touching it. We're not doing anything. We're always making some kind of small or major change if we have to, if there's something critically wrong with it. But honestly, during the off season between uh, the end of one season and the beginning of the next, that's when we do the least amount of work because we want to try to start the season super strong with a known combination. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the middle of the season is when we'll do the biggest updates. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Based on what other people are 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 how how other teams are performing, and you need to either catch up or 
fine tune that, or is it you go? Oh, this thing failed, and we need to fix that. So the the, the <laughs> failure points are something that <laughs> yeah, the failure points is something that we address immediately, of mm. course. But um, those are typically uh, so if we're having a suspension breakage issue. Uh, maybe we get we, the car takes a hit and it breaks the su- suspension component too easily. We have to make sure we have enough spares mm. so we can continue to on with that event and go to the next event. But on the side, we'll be building a, an updated version. And so we'll build an updated version, then cycle that in on the practice day at FD, make sure that's good to verify it, and then we'll move to that new one. Um, but if it's not good, we'll put the old stuff back. If it's not better, we'll put the old stuff back on. And we work the same way with the engines. We'll have a primary engine program, and I'll have a secondary engine program that might address some reliability issues or make more power or whatever it is. And so during a practice day or something, we'll put the new updated version in. And if it's better and shows that it's reliable, we'll run that one. And if it makes it through the weekend, then we'll make more of them. Mm-hmm. But if it doesn't, it comes back out and the old stuff goes in. Mm-hmm. So the the whole, the the, the fundamental philosophy is, does this change we're going to do give us a tangible result of a better actual finish of that next event? Right. Not just the cool stuff and not just chasing, you know, something that, that it has to make a performance. When I say performance, I mean, like, does it help you get a better trophy? Right. Will it help you physically, like, like win that event? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes sense. How quick can you do an engine swap track side? <laughs> so we came I mean, you're from... Talking, uh, clearly, you can do it between one day and the next, right? So it's a matter of two hours? An hour or so. That's pretty good. Yeah, an hour or so. So we came from drag racing, and right. you break everything. You break... You're, that's just sort of the thing. Like, you run it as hard as you can, and then it breaks, and then you put the spare motor in, and you figure out what broke, and you make that thing stronger for the next event. Mm-hmm. And that's just this constant development of trying to go faster. Because with the drag racing, it's like... Yeah, you can make a bunch of power, but the way you prove that you're doing a better job building engines is by going to the track and beating these guys down the drag strip. Right. Having that, so so in drag racing, everything was built to change the engine quickly because you'd have to do it between rounds sometimes, and so you might have to do that in 30 minutes. Yeah. So we would build these drag race cars in a way that is really easy to work on, and then have the spare engine with all these components and already on already on it. So we use that same philosophy with the drift cars when we build them. Um, and especially because we're building, we're using engines like the Corolla has a 2.7 liter engine, the Super has a three liter engine, and we're competing against seven liter supercharged and turbocharged <laughs> yeah. engines. So we run these things way harder. Yeah. And the, the, we're just going to have more failures. Sure. Right? Um, so we just prepare for that with spare parts and making the cars easy to, easy to work on. It seems like for a while everybody was going towards V8 power and stuff like that, and then they, they backed off it a little bit. What was that? Is it just corporate influence, like from from Toyota and others that go, look, we need you to do this with something that can, people can relate to, and not just run an NASCAR engine? Or is there is the is has the technology made it easier or more efficient to to do it with a different type of engine? Uh, I think there's a misconception that the V8 stuff was going to be less expensive and more reliable, mm-hmm. and. At the 800 horsepower and below, for sure, because you can just get a Corvette LS7 engine and put some parts, maybe a supercharger or something like that, and and do well. But once the competition got up to and the tires got good, and you know, you got to the point to where you you need a thousand or 1200 on some of these tracks like Irwindale, then it, it actually becomes very expensive to build a V8 that's reliable at that horsepower level, and it was. Uh, and it's also very complica- complicated because the turbo system or the superchargers were sometimes unreliable, and then the packaging, and then the weight. It just kind of got to the point to where the V8s weren't were less competitive sure. in, the, in those ways. And there was so much development that happened on the, the drag race scene with two JZs, and um, that would be probably the, the popular engine. Or uh, like, uh, what are they, uh, v, VR38s? Yeah, the GTR engines. Yep, yeah. the Nissan GTR engine. They were so easily making, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 horsepower. Sure. When you detuned them and ran them at 1,000 or 1,200, uh, they were pretty reliable in drift. Yeah. And they were lighter weight and using production heads and production blocks. And it was really interesting how that the cylinder head and the, the, the modern technology on a smaller displacement engine can be better than a large displacement uh, two-valve. Yeah. I think that 
it, it also makes sense when you think about the heat generated by an aftermarket twin turbo system in, say, the front of a Corvette or the front of a Mustang or something. There's just not enough airflow to manage that effectively, whereas if you know a GTR is running 2,500 horsepower in the standing mile, you can go, you can back that down by half, and it's like, yeah, no problem, we're good. People daily drive at those engines. Yeah. Um, so it's it's kind of interesting how that technology has evolved so quickly. And it's and it's fun being in a sport where the rules allow that. Mm-hmm. We, our, our rule book in Formula Drift is super thin, and the engine page. Honestly, I can't even close my eyes and think of reading the engine rules because it's literally it's open. Like I think it says <laughs> engines are open. The blank. They just limit the fuels you can use. Mm-hmm. So you can use E85 or ethanol based gasoline things like that. You just can't use nitromethane and and whatever. Sure. But there's almost no rules with the engines. What do you guys use? C16 or We use, do you use uh, E85. We use E85 from a company called Ignite. Uh-huh. They call it their uh, 114. And the reason we don't use pump E85 is because we found that the racing stuff is more consistent. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, is it pure consistency, or is it in theory the same as what you're getting from the pump? It's just not. It's just more pure. Like it's, it's not yeah. like it's designed to make more power. It's just a better quality product. It's a better quality product. Yeah. They. Uh, my understanding, they farm it and distill it and everything here in the United States in Indiana. Mm. And uh, the extra fuel, the the non, the like fifteen part, fucking bootlegging. Right, it sounds yeah, like whiskey. Like 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 he actually sells to a bunch of uh, like Listerine and like some of the alcohol. Com- That's alcohol. kind of interesting. Yeah, so I I don't know much about it, but like the the same distillation process, industrial distillation process that they make the alcohol that goes into that you, you drink is similar to what goes huh. into the fuel. Oh, that's very wow. interesting. So so that product is, I guess, it sounds like much more precise, whereas what you get at the pump, even if it fluctuates one or 2% in mix, that would obviously have an effect on your engine, your horsepower reliability. Is that is that why you guys go with it? Okay. Yeah, we need consistency. And then also um, these cars can sit for a, a period of time. And we found that this fuel that we're using, it doesn't gum up the injectors or clog them up or do anything, uh, any issues like that. Like back in the drag racing days when we used methanol, when you'd finish with a weekend, you'd actually put like race gasoline in the car, put a different tune up in it, and then, you know, drain all the, the methanol out, put the, the get racing gas in, and then start it up so it would flow through the fuel system so it wouldn't corrode or cause mm. any issues in the fuel system. Well, that's uh, what I was like hearing it. about ethanol for a while is that it would corrode your fuel system. Is that is that still the case? I haven't I haven't in California, like in LA, we don't really fuck with the eighty five so much. Or if you go a lot of other places, it's much more common. But there's there's no stations around here that sell the eighty five. You have to you have to go out to like other places to get it. So I don't think about it all that often. Some E eighty fives can gum your stuff up. They can yeah, and they come the injectors up and stuff if they, if they sit for a while. And that's another reason we've stayed with the same fuel is because you know over the last eight years or however long we've been using it. Uh, we don't have issues with that. And there's also a cooling property because there's more fuel that's used to make the same power. It's actually less efficient fuel. Mm-hmm. Uh, but with but the be- drifting, you know, you're not getting a bunch of airflow over it. Right. And we're making this huge power and huge heat. Uh, using an ethanol-based fuel, uh, it keeps the engine temperatures lower. That makes sense. Yeah, and in the short run, it's not like the efficiency matters for you, right? Do you just run like a little five-gallon cell or something? We run an eight gallon, yeah. uh, and I think it uses a couple gallons every couple passes. Yeah, and so we'll put new rear tires and fuel in it uh, every time it comes in. Mm. Every two runs, basically. Yeah, that's. What is the uh, what does it cost to do a weekend? Like, assuming you've built a car, is it like hundred grand a weekend to run FD? Much less than that, uh, I think. Jen Horsey, that works with us, did a calculation and kind of compared it to a bunch of other motorsports. I think it was in the $30,000 range. At a pro I, level, that's not bad. Well, what's interesting is I think it equated to similar to other motorsport because if we only do eight events, um, so imagine if we did, like the NASCAR guys are doing, what, like 30 events or something Probably, like that? yeah. At 30000 a weekend, you know, you're into the 
what is that 900 yeah 900 000? grand yeah, yeah 900 uh, grand well then there's more per weekend <laughs> they have a lot, there's more, a lot pe- more they have more people they got a lot of people honestly that's what 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 we found with the motorsport the biggest expense is logistics and sure. people yeah uh, which is fine i'm i i you know you want to it is what where, it is. That's where you spend money on people. Yeah, it is <laughs> yeah. what it is. But you, you yeah. know, you're not. You don't need enough people to do a tire change in four seconds. You know, you you can you can do it. You could do that job with a couple guys in between runs. Well, how many how many techs? Let's say, let's say a car is a problem and it comes in between runs. How many people are diving on that car? You know, from Papadakis. Each car will have generally three three crew plus yeah. a driver. So you have a spotter, maybe uh, which might be that also the tuner. Um, or the crew chief, and then two technicians that are working on it. Yeah, so NASCAR is probably four times that many people. Oh, yeah. At least. When I had been down to TRD, and that's just, you know, at the track. When I had been on TRD in Costa Mesa, this giant facility, and they're building all these NASCAR engines and all this stuff all over the place, and they're supporting four vehicles. Yeah. So it's it's different. Yeah. I don't, I don't, it's very different. Um, But even, like, compared to, like, Ferrari Challenge or one of those kind of high-end spec racing series. If you're a gentleman driver and you want to do a weekend of Ferrari Challenge, you're paying two hundred grand. Yeah, it, it's uh, it, it. I think it's more than thirty grand once you look into the whole year and everything like that. For sure, it's more. But um, drifting is a reasonable. It's sort of in between like the grassroots road racing and like what you're talking about the gentleman mm-hmm. uh, GT racing and stuff like that but it, it's sort of like we sort of backdoored motorsport a little bit with this and that's what i did with the old import drag racing stuff as well was there was this traditional racing and it was very expensive it was expensive to get in like you had to have this like tribal knowledge and or it was just very expensive and very time consuming to kind of get up to speed but you know from my old import drag racing days and even when drifting when i moved to drifting the sport was at its infancy, and the technology wasn't very um, advanced, and the other competitors weren't spending a bunch of money, so it wasn't a you know a, a competition of pocketbooks. And you know it was able to you know you get your kind of a foothold in it if you did a good job and and start uh, hopefully making a you know I was able to make it into a professional career. Yeah, is there anything happening in the world of? drag racing recently that's worth paying attention to the grassroots high level builds are out of control like if you just search you know for some of the the recent okay the one one that i saw recently that was amazing is i guess these guys are taking the audi v10s the r8s Mm -hmm. and the gallardo maybe is a similar chassis yeah same yeah and they're making well over 2000 close to 3000 horsepower out of the v10s yeah they're tough motors and they're using some of the factory electronics, like with piggyback, you know, systems, mm-hmm. but using like factory launch controls. They're running deep into like the seven second quarter miles at well over 200 miles an hour. I saw one that was doing a wheelie on launch. It was Dude, a they're Huracan like Huracan that did a wheelie. They're not it's even pretty just, badass. <laughs> so, so they have all these these setups in the ECU to limit how much it pulls the wheels. <laughs> they will literally do half track power wheelies like a motorcycle <laughs> at like 130 miles an hour so uh, my, my buddy john reed who helps us out with a bunch of tuning stuff tunes a bunch of like lambos and, and stuff like that and he was saying the problem that they have with going the challenge they have with going quicker in the quarter mile or even the half mile stuff is not making more power it's keeping the front wheels on the ground that's crazy so they instead of having Why traction they gone with the fling Bring back the fling. Well, that's not Chris, effective. Chris until Rado you're was here with this. We need we need more fling. Uh, I, dude, I don't know that scene, but it seems as like the pimp move is like keeping your leather <laughs> interior and all that kind of stuff. Like these guys, they they pride themselves on it's got like stock interior, right, stock wiring, right. and the factory drive train, and so that's the the competition right. that they're in. Yeah, it's funny when they start putting those those asterisks on there. Like, it's like, okay, yeah, you're running set, but it's like fastest, fastest full interior, no piggybacks, you know, pump gas, drivetrain. That's, uh, the, that's fastest, where I came from. Yeah. That's yeah. when I was doing, when I was, you know, 18 years old, 19 years old, and we were doing all the import drag racing stuff, there was a, comp- there was a magazine called TMR. And every month that little magazine would have like a list of like the quickest, 
like four door accord right. or like lamp like uh, eagle talon yes. or whatever it is like it literally was in writing and then later on when super street came out they had a whole section with the different like fastest of all these different things so you know everybody wants a participation award and they all want to get their thing and that's right. how we do it nowadays <laughs> right but it is fun. it's like it it's i kind of understand why they break it down like that but it's just funny to read when it's to me, when it's like, oh yeah, fastest, fastest all motor, no this. It's like, well, but, but you could, but you could do that other thing. It's not like there's anything really stopping you from taking out your interior if you want to go faster. I don't know. I think part Maybe of I'm it just is a curmudgeon. I think part of it is you got guys uh, or companies that have a street car based business, mm -hmm. and they want to show that they can build the most epic version of whatever your Huracan or, or R8. That makes sense. And then so you, you're more likely to get the exhaust from them. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. That makes sense, yeah. Those cars are, those V10s are like real tough. They do, you could you can make deep into four-figure horsepower with the, the stock bottom ends, and people regularly do. Ford GTs also. And, and so that's, that's the thing is you, you kind of compare, like why aren't more people using, you know, V8s and stuff for these high power drift competitions, once you get to the four figure range, even though it's a big displacement, the architecture, uh, you know, is limiting. Yeah. So, why aren't they using V10? Right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> how long? How long is the V10 versus? How didn't long someone is the LS? do a V10? Uh, didn't someone put an M5 motor in a three series BMW? Was it Michael Essa? He did. I think he yeah, did, right? Like, yeah. And the Viper uh, has a V10, but that's that's, true, uh, yeah. that's not that's, a good V10. No. <laughs> it's not great. Although there's a lot of, uh, there was a thread this morning on Twitter about uh, Viper engine swaps into stuff. I guess a lot of people are putting Viper V10s into stuff just because they're ridiculous. Well, I th think you can make an argument that on a street car, why do you need anything over seven or 800 horsepower? Yeah. Like, what are you going to do with that except for tell your buddies that it's got it? So um, I'm sure that other folks would argue that, <laughs> whatever I'm saying. But, like, uh, I, I mean, have you? what is a street car that you've driven that's over seven or 800 horsepower? I have driven a couple of cars that are over that and is few and far between where I can actually make any kind of use of it. I mean, a couple of tuner cars. I drove one of those Calvo Vipers. It's like 2,000 horsepower. And you're, you know, it's so deeply antisocial what you're doing with that type of thing. To even get into the boost is so dangerous uh, on a public road. And a couple of the twin turbo V10 cars as well and fast GTRs. Nothing like really, the fastest stuff is from the factory is like McLarens um, and the Remac or Remats, is it pronounced correctly? Have you fucked with one of those things? The Nevera? It's a 1,900 horsepower electric supercar, and it runs an 862 on the street at 166 or something like that. And I did it. I did it on the street in fucking Malibu. And it's silent. No one knows you're doing it. And you just do it over and over. And it's like, it's amazing. It's the coolest thing ever. And it's like, easy, no problem. But that's it. If you're not... It, it, you know, with electric cars, if you're not doing that thing, it might as well just be a Tesla or a Hyundai. You know, there's no, uh, there's no, there's nothing fun about cruising it around slowly. It's just it's silent and it's smooth and eh, it only it's only when you hit the floorboard that the craziness happens. Yeah, I've been <laughs> thinking that the electric car. I, I love electric car in traffic. Yeah, but anything's like. For fun on the weekend, yeah, I want a manual I'm transmission. You. I'm with you. And, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, but, but the you person like the, who buy this yeah. is not an either or. This, you, you're, if you're buying a Ramac, you're at and. You're not. There's no either or. You're not deciding between this and a Carrera GT. It's and and and, and a Bugatti and a Pagani and a this and a that and a La Ferrari and this is your seventeenth car. Well, I mean, it's like getting an uh, expensive watch with more functions, right? Mm -hmm. Is it functions? Is that what they call it? Yeah. Or complications? Complications. Yeah, there you go. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's not your only watch. The Jacob & Co. fucking fishbowl astronomia, that's not your, That's not an everyday watch. But I don't need the complication to show me that the moon's out. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, what were you saying? You, you would like the, the guy that created this company, Ramatz, when he was 19, he built an E30 
drag racing standing mile type car, but it was electric. In this, in, how old is he now? He's like 29. No, I want to say he's like 34. So he's young. Like 14 years ago, yeah, you know, electric young. technology was really new, but he built this record-setting E30. And then when he's looking for more parts for it, there weren't out there. So he made the company that then developed all these new technologies. And if you jump ahead, like their technology got so good that Porsche invested money, a bunch of hypercar and supercar companies use their EV technology. And, you know, they make stuff like this. And so now he's the cool. CEO of Bugatti. Yeah. They gave him Bugatti. They were like, oh, you can just have us. What country is it from? Croatia. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That car is amazing. I drove it, and it's it's a lovely thing. It's built really well, and it handles well, and it you you, you wouldn't get in it and go, this is the first product from this company. It, it's very finished and polished, and it's stupendously fast, horrifyingly fast. But, and it's just the nature of being an electric car, when you're not when you're not pushing the limits of accelerative force, it's boring because all electric cars are boring unless you're doing something insane. Which Look at the fucking numbers, though. 1.97 to 60. Uh, what does that say? Four, I don't know how that... I don't know what the 400... Is that a qu oh, it's a quarter mile. Yeah, 400 and something meter times. 8.6, yeah. yeah. I mean... It, a, a stock car running eight six is on on regular ass tires, not even on like Cup twos. It does it on regular tires. It's pretty crazy. So let's say let's say you're gonna go cruise with your buddies, and they're, hey, we're gonna go on a little canyon run, and that thing's parked next to the three forty eight. Which one do you three forty eight? Yeah, all, right. all day, all day. I mean, I, I I give me a naturally aspirated high revving motor and a stick shift, but that's just that's me. But if I had money for 25 cars, yeah, I'd have one of those. Mm. Sure. Mm. And then the next week, you drive that one. Yeah. Yeah. I alternate. Yeah. It's just, it's impressive what people are capable of and what, what cars are capable of now. The one that I was watching recently was uh, Gordon Murray has this T50 <laughs> car, which I'm sure you know well. <laughs> I, but I, I just found it. I'm looking, I'm surfing around on YouTube. Did you hear it? <laughs> on YouTube, I heard it. So yeah. it's not really hearing it, but it was impressive. And they showed it the engine at Cosworth being built mm -hmm. and all the, the, um, the, the the technology was really cool because he kept it. He said, I'm going to have this thing. Well, the philosophy was really neat because he kept it lightweight. He said, I'm going to have a manual transmission with a clutch. Yeah. I want a high revving 12,100 RPM engine. Mm -hmm. And it's going to have a V10, which is going to sound amazing. A 12, but yeah. Pardon, yeah. 12, but it, but it's it's like a 3.9 liter V12. It's awesome. Oh, V12, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. V12. We had Gordon on the show and it was amazing 90 minutes of radio. It was so interesting. He was the coolest. I get that guy. It'd be cool to watch <laughs> you talk to him because yeah. because you are very fastidious with engineering and you've built these amazing cars, amazing engines, and your deep dives on your race or competition engines are also really fascinating. Um, have you ever been to a Have you been to Cosworth or, or shops like that of just these legendary engine building places? Uh, only TRD here in Costa Mesa, okay. and I've been to uh, you know Ed Pink Racing oh, here, yeah. but they do a lot of uh, vintage mm -hmm. racing engines, so they have some really cool um, older Indy car engines and GTP and stuff like that. But uh, no, it's I would love to you know go to like I mean, Cosworth used to do a bunch of our machine work here in Torrance in California, when, but they were just doing the Indy car engines. Right. They didn't have the high uh, end Formula One stuff there. So the. Um, uh, the stuff with uh, with the T50, you know, he's also got that sucker fan on there. You seen the sucker fan? Dude, he, the one, on one of the videos, he showed how it works, like with the diffuser yeah. and like it pulls from this area diffuser to clean up the air. Yeah. Blew my mind. He, yeah. The guy, I, I never even knew about Gordon Murray until, until the, I guess. Oh, I, really? I, I, I'm in my own little world with That's all the import fine. stuff, yeah. and I don't. I now as I get older, I care more. I think about well, the old. Well, you knew vintage. about the McLaren F1, right? I mean, you must have a casual familiarity with the McLaren F1. That's as much as I had. Yeah, yeah. That's his thing. Now it, they couldn't get much more Gordon Murray than that shirt. <laughs> that is the most Gordon Murray shirt ever. <laughs> it's like a crazy wide shirt. But the sucker fan thing is really interesting. Have you seen the McMurtry Spearling? You know, no. Any idea what that is? It's the car that just set the record up the Goodwood hill climb. Oh, I saw, you saw I the, seen video. the video. It looks like it's in fast forward. Yep. Yeah. So that's that. That's the newest like next level of crazy. That thing makes two thousand pounds of downforce at zero miles an hour, sitting there. 
Is it 100% electric? 100% music? electric. Uh, and it's tiny and it looks weird as shit. And it uh, is the fastest, I think, accelerating car in history. What was the number, Zach? The zero to 60 number? Does it, did it say? I forget. The number is, you can't believe it's real. Is that something they're selling? Yeah, or? yeah. Oh. They're selling those things. I don't think they're street legal. I heard, uh, mm. oh. hang on. The num- it's like 1.4 to 60, I think. It's like somebody like just scaled up an yeah, RC 1. car. Yeah, one point four and the quarter mile in seven point nine seconds. But then when you go around corners, because obviously it has all this downforce, that's when things get even more weird. Can we watch the Goodwood Run? Yeah, because it's the Goodwood Run was so insane. It it just doesn't look real. And yeah, and it has like this uh, this trail from the arrow in the center of it, like yeah. an actual yeah. I mean, it is okay. This this section here, <laughs> the way it's <laughs> sucking up the so dust from the yeah. track. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's sucking up the dust and blowing it out the fan in the back. Look at this! It doesn't look. It's they run like prototype race cars up this hill, like Lamar cars, and it, this thing is just murdering them. Oh like, God. if that fan turned off for a second. Oof, the loss of grip. Yeah, it would be a energy, problem. But it's amazing. It is such it's, an incredible piece of engineering. <laughs> the rooster tail of dust is so insane. <laughs> that's awesome. It's so fucking fast. Well, that's yeah. what you get when there's no rules. Oh, right. I wonder. <laughs> yeah, when the rule book is even thinner than <laughs> yeah. FD. Does FD allow sucker fan? Hmm. So oh, no would sucker, that help? A no know. sucker fan rule? Well, it's got to help somewhat, right? Because, I mean, otherwise, why do those cars have wings? Your cars don't really have wings, do they? Uh, yeah, so th- the theory we have with the wing is not necessarily a downforce thing. So, you know, we have a, like a bow and arrow, and the arrow has like those feathers and stuff on the back, right? Yes. That's not, so what that, my understanding is what that does is it creates drag in the back of the arrow, so it mm. continues to want to point the correct direction. And so in the drift car, we would put wings on it and add basically drag so when the car would start getting really sideways it would start trying to pull it straight that's interesting yeah but none of the cars you're running this year use wings so is it not as helpful as originally thought we have found that it it's driver dependence so frederick likes the likes without arrow Hmm. and honestly that's probably an area of development that would take these cars to the next level um but, I mean, to tell you the truth, I mean, if we won the championship the last couple of years and there's not much really knocking on our door as far as technology, right? then we tend to kind of go off on the same direction and and really focus on the drivers doing a good job and having like a good show. Um, I would be concerned with coming out with some technology that somehow stepped us above everybody else. Not that we could necessarily do that, but like to try to focus on that and then just sort of break the show. Like right. we're so dominant that... Nobody can compete with us anymore. I don't think that's in anybody's interest. I've been doing motorsport long enough to kind of know that that when can kind of hurt you in some ways. Yeah. And um, that's so interesting. Yeah. If you're, yeah. if you're already winning, don't push further. That sounds wrong the way you just put it, but <laughs> but uh, I, I you know I think I could be debated on this and maybe be swayed in a different direction, but. For the for the enjoyment of the watching the sport and the longevity of it and trying to not get the costs out of control, um, and what can happen is we can build something on Aero and it's super successful and it works really well, and then all of a sudden just get um, uh, the rule change and then being it disallowed, right? And then all of a sudden all this effort and all this everything that we put into it is all for naught. Yeah, and that happens to you know all the time in, in motorsport and I, maybe rightfully so you know if it doesn't really help the show and now everybody has to go spend all this money on development and every put all this arrow on their drift cars like is that the where we're trying to go with the sport i, I don't think so well, that's no, what they, they tried just... to curtail that with f1 with the cost caps is it was just getting so expensive the top teams were able to spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and if they were just running away with you know place one two three you know, the field, the rest of the field gets left behind, like literally and figuratively. And it goes, well, is this the best thing for the sport or is this just a way to where the richest teams win all the time? So they put a uh, cap in place. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm and I don't have that drive inside of me maybe because I'm older to just 
dominate everything all of the time because somehow, you know what I mean? Not, not like I could, but like, that's just, you know, we're all having, we, we love going to the racetrack and we love competing and I want to try to extend that as long as I can. Sure. <laughs> so that would be more of the, the foresight, you know, forethought than anything else. Yeah. Is Formula Drift on a good uh, trajectory right now as a series? They are. From the metrics that I've seen, and just literally looking around at the people that are at these events and looking at the amount of people in the stands and how they sell out basically every event. And then I've got friends that don't go to other motorsport. They don't go to NHRA. They don't go to NASCAR. They don't go to even – maybe they supercross, and they'll do some, some drift stuff. Um, and that's – I, I'm 46, which is kind of older now, yeah. but it's my generation, like under 50, that I think are not so interested in the the legacy motorsport and more interested in these what you'd call like the the new new motorsports like drifting and uh, and some of the call it import drag racing or whatever or like the sport compact. So yeah. yeah, that's cool. I'm glad to see. I'm glad the series is doing well. I mean, other series are having some struggles. Well, that's been a thing for years, like NASCAR and, and NHRA. Every year, the average attendee would get a year older. Right. Right, because they weren't bringing anybody in new. Yeah. And um, I, I, I should be someone that wants to watch that, right? Because I'm into motorsport, I'm into this stuff. But I, my argument is, like, the, the drag racing at the NHRA pro level is neat. Definitely have to do that. Like it's a bucket life list thing. Like you go there and you see these cars live, and they're amazing. It's the most one of the most amazing things mm-hmm. watching these, feeling those cars go down the, the quarter mile. But after I do it a couple times, I'm like, oh, okay, I think I'm good. And then the NASCAR stuff, it's just spec racing to me. So unless you care about the drivers, which mm-hmm. I don't, I don't even know who won the championship last year. But like, so I don't follow it. Yeah. And I watch it a little bit. I'm like, nah. And the, and the, the the time that I've gone to NASCAR, I literally fell asleep. It like, like it put me to sleep in the stand. It's I literally like it. a white noise machine. Yeah. <laughs> but I have had fun because I've had a, a a pit pass before. So I went and I filmed one of, a YouTube video of mine uh, and and filmed it going into the pits, and it was really fun going into the pits and they have like a um, like a walkway in the garage and watching these guys work on the car and seeing under the hood. That was interesting to me. Uh, so if there was more of that and more technical insights into what was happening with these cars, I would probably follow it a bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but I don't. And, uh, and, and I think F1 is such a spectacle. And like with Drive to Survive, obviously they give you some you know, insight into that. Yeah. I, that's, I mean, my wife even will watch that with me. Yeah. So that's, that's like a combination of a motorsport and a reality show all at the same time. But it's so out of control. Like, the money and the cars yeah. and the scene and the travel and the locations like uh, I don't there's no other motorsport that I can think of that I, but matches I, like, that. I watch Drive to Survive and some people give me shit on Twitter because I watch Drive to Survive and I don't watch the races I don't think the races are that interesting but I like the story that's crafted even if it's not entirely true true to fact and, and accurate but I'm more interested in the personalities and does this strategy that I now have more insight into pay off during the race. And I only need to see like four minutes of the race. I don't need to see the whole race, you know, and I just find that more interesting and entertaining. Uh, And if they had that for other motorsports and it was done to the same level, I could probably be interested in that too. But it's hard to get into other motorsports for me, especially when they're spec racing like NASCAR and IndyCar. And the characters are so... The F1, there's like, these are real people, but mm-hmm. there's such characters in F1. And the stakes are so high that I think there's there's something compelling there. For whatever reason, NASCAR and IndyCar doesn't do that for me. Like, I don't feel like the stakes are high enough for right. me to, to, well, be, to so engage me. Well, there's so few drivers in IndyCar, right? There's so few drivers. There's even fewer team principals, right? And I think there's a lot of buy rides there, maybe. I in, in, in some ways, it feels less professional to me. I, I clearly I don't follow it enough to know enough <laughs> to really comment, you yeah. know, well on IndyCar stuff. So yeah, but it's just something about it to me is not all that interesting. Even though on a super on the surface level, it's not that much different from F1. Uh, Very fast open wheel cars and you know, ah, 
the tracks are so much crazier and the cars are I think the cars are cooler to look at on, on the F1 cars are really cool. True. Like, there's, like yeah. they're more eye pleasing to me. Yeah. When I look at an indie car, it looks to me like, like the ugly kind of like we tried to be a Formula One car, but we couldn't get there, and we did a bunch of cost cutting measures. In what order does this to year's indie car look like, Zach? I'm not even sure I know what this year's indie car looked like, which is kind of embarrassing. But and the F1 cars, they left them open, which adds that level of danger mm-hmm. still, even with the halo. Um, and then once you stick the driver in the cockpit, I don't know. It's I don't know. I haven't what put that is, much thought into it. What does this year's IndyCar look like? Oops. It looks like oh, so it's a Delara uh, yeah. Delara car, and they obviously all look. They the same. knew that they knew that the last car was really ugly. Yeah, and I think they changed it due to that. I know. don't. I think this car, the 2023 car, that that looks like a pretty decent looking car. I think the. The windshield takes away from seeing the driver, but I'm sure it's there for a safety reason. All right, yeah. so, so now, Zach, compare that to an F2 car. Formula 2 car? Yeah. Is a Formula 2 car great? Let's see. Uh. Formula 2. So this is the step that you would take before you went into F1. Yeah. And That's a much it, better looking car. Yeah. It, something. I don't know, man. The, the, the guys in Europe just have another level on us out here. Yeah, that is a better looking car. I agree with you there. But I'm not watching F2, so it's not, oh, it's yeah, not no, like it's, you know, it's hard to find that broadcast, I think. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's great. good in pink, though. I will take I mean, it, it in pink. It looks like an F1 car to me. I don't think it's... It looks pretty close to an F1, just with a slightly less crazy wing and, diffuse, and front splitter. Yeah. But similar center sections. Um, got it. We got anything on the Patreon for uh, Mr. Papadakis here? We do. Let's go to that. Of course, if you want to ask questions of our guests, patreon.com slash the smoking tire podcast. Also get the show ad free. Get it ahead of everybody else. Uh, don't make don't have to wait till Tuesday and Thursday like those plebes down there with their free feeds. You know how it is. Of course, our new championship tier. You can get our car review videos ad free as well. Let's go to them. Zach. And Justin Gerard says, uh, Steph, your content for the Super Build was legit some of the best content I've ever seen. Can you please make more? Please make more. Not a question, just a request. Thanks for the feedback. <laughs> and uh, yeah, man, um, I appreciate the feedback. Uh, Miguel says, uh, I'm a Ford dealer tech, but want to get into your type of wrenching. I just work on trucks. It's getting boring. What should I do to set myself up for your line of work, meaning more fun and specialized? Get a car and build it. That's my advice as well. Um, is It sounds like he's already a wrencher. Um, I, my suggestion is always get a car that you don't have to drive to work. That's very inexpensive. So get like a two thousand dollar Subaru or something that breaks down a lot. Learn how to work on it, and then start working on buddies' cars, and eventually maybe make a friend at a shop, and then try to work at the shop. But the, the challenge is, if you already a Ford dealer tech, you're probably making more money than you're going to make in the aftermarket working on you know hot rods. Um, unless you are literally the person building the hot rods within a shop. So at that point, now you're, uh, you're kind of, you need a lot of experience to do that. So again, it kind of comes back to build something pretty exotic and special for yourself, get all the experience, and then make it special enough that other people will pay you to do that for them. Yeah. If you're already a tech, at least you've got the confidence to turn wrenches on stuff. It's not like I'm the computer guy and now I want to you know, take apart a cylinder head totally different skill set yeah but you have to be the the key of it is you need to be good enough and better than somebody else that somebody will pay you a premium Mm. to work on their car Mm -hmm. like so yeah you need that experience yeah uh lucas says i understand why young guys in the late 90s built front wheel drive performance cars but to take the extremes you did always seemed quixotic Good word. What was the motivation to break front-wheel drive drag racing records? So I started off with my first car was a front-wheel drive Honda Civic, and we would, um, uh, I was very young, you race them around the street a little bit, 
But then we'd go to like Bally Imports and the actual drag strip. Like that was just the car I had was a front wheel drive car. And my buddies all had front wheel drive cars. And that was the scene that we were in. And it came, comes back to like that title of like who's got the quickest front wheel drive car. Mm-hmm. And that was just the thing that we were pointing at. And, and I would, because the V8 and the rear wheel drive stuff was so many generations before us and was so sorted out, we were having fun blazing a trail with front wheel drive drag racing. No one had really done it before. And everybody was telling us, you guys are dumb. They're not going to go quick. Like you can't get good traction with the front wheel drive. You're using four cylinder engines and they're just keep blowing up. Like you can't make the right poor power. And we were, didn't know what we didn't know. We're just like, yeah, whatever. But we're still having fun. And this is the car we've got. Mm. And Fortunately, you know, there was a lot of potential in the front wheel drive and there was a lot of potential in the in the four cylinder engines and we can continue to go quicker to where we started being a lot quicker than some of the Mustangs and the Camaros and stuff like that. And it was just kind of fun blazing trail there and having fun with your friends in a different uh, not not following other people's the history of what other people had done. Yeah. What is what could people be doing in that vein now? I mean, what is the what is the newest thing that people where there's not maybe you know, elect- a, I guess electric, but uh, but that kind of is being done, isn't it? Yeah, but like you just said earlier, with the guy that built that supercar, like he built his old BMW electric, yeah. mm-hmm. and he backdoored the whole auto industry yeah. somehow by doing that. Yeah, and that's what I did was yeah. I started doing front wheel drive cars, and I backdoored the whole motorsport industry by doing that. If I tried to go the traditional path of like building V8s and Mustangs and trying to go the normal NHRA Mm -hmm. route, like, I don't think I would have had success. Yeah, true. Uh, Michael says, what car would you most like to run with an unlimited budget? I assume you mean, it means in drift. Yeah, so what's interesting is I've had some conversations about using that Audi V10. Oh, yeah. So I think it'd be really fun to use some kind of really cool sounding engine that you're like, what is that? Like, I literally have to go live to see that. So maybe like a a Lexus LFA engine. Oh, yeah. Um, So something like an LFA would be pretty amazing. Is that Ferrari still going? It is. Oh, the 599. Yeah, it was like a 599 with twin superchargers or twin turbos on it or something. But what's interesting, I didn't think it sounded very good. And then there's really? a, there's an Aston Martin that has a V12 or V10. Oh, yeah. And a supercharged one. Uh-huh. And it was loud, but it didn't have the right tone for me. Really? But it was definitely unique. And I have some friends that love it. Like, that is literally their most their favorite uh, drift car. Oh, so. it's a twin supercharged V12. Twin supercharged V12? Wow, lots of, lots of weight in the nose. A lot of weight in those. And And it's a little quieter because of the superchargers. Yeah, how hmm. interesting. Uh, Kayvon says, I loved your Celica barn find video. Oh, yeah, that was what you drove up to uh, Newcomb's Ranch. That car is real cool. Remind me me the story on that car? Uh, So I was looking for a pre-75 and older car Mm -hmm. to do a pre-smog in California. And I was trying to do something super analog, carburetors, um, just because all the super technical electronic stuff I use daily yeah i wanted to go like full reversal on it for like my fun street car do you know ha- how like to tune carburetors to make them good i have some experience because okay. i had dual Makuni side drafts on a, a honda uh, years ago okay and um it, it, was, it was terrible <laughs> <laughs> uh and I, I guess i wanted something challenging and i felt like the um the the folks that know how to do that well are few and far between nowadays, mm-hmm. or they're old and retiring or passing away or whatever. And I thought, you know, when I get old, maybe I just want to restore old cars. I don't know. I, I want to be a well-rounded uh, technician and understand these cars really well. So that was some of the impetus on wanting to get the Celica um, and then having fun with it on the street. It would happen at a lower speed because uh, it's, like, you could go slower in those cars and still have a bunch of fun. Yeah. And, um, and so my buddy's really into uh, Toyota's guy, my buddy Joji. And he has a 71 Celica that he let me drive. And I was like, oh, my God, I really like the ergonomics. It feels cool. And he's like, I might know where there's a car. So he let me know about this car that was uh, uh, a widow owned. The guy who built it had passed away you know, a few years ago. And it was just sitting in the garage. And, um, and he, and It's a cool I, looking car. Yeah. Yeah. Super fun. It was super dusty and, and quite a mess when I picked it up. But it had a bunch of old JDM parts on it, like the 18G, 18RG engine. Uh, it had the fender flares on it. Like, that's the paint that he had painted it years ago. So there's some rock chips and everything on it. But, I mean, it's a full-on driver's car now. Like, 
I'll take it up. I don't care about rock chips. Like it's it's a super fun car. Yeah. yeah. Can we it's talk cool. about your Rav Four real quick? Oh yeah, because <laughs> two door Rav Four. I mean, thing talk rules. about like going a different direction from your day job. Let's say. Oh, that's good. But uh, there it is. I mean, this video was so entertaining. I'll, I'll <laughs> that thing rules. Little little first gen two door Rav Four. Uh, so cute, bouncing along. Yeah, it is cute. It's even purple. Yeah, so, it's a great color. Um, so I've got a bunch of, but the couple of guys I work I work with have off road cars, Forerunner, uh, Lexus GX four seventy, you know Tacomas and and Jeeps and stuff like that. So and they were starting to go off roading, and I was like, I want to go off roading. I used to do a bunch of stuff in Glamis, have had sand cars and dirt uh-huh. bikes and all kinds of stuff, but haven't had any toys like that for a while. And I've been resistant to spend. Twenty or thirty thousand dollars on a Forerunner, and then spent a bunch of money on suspension, all this stuff. I was like, there might be another. Maybe there's another way of doing this. And my inspiration was uh, the Dakar uh, Rally X mm-hmm. or Rally Raid. Rally Raid, I think, is what they call it. So Rally. Uh, so in Paris Dakar, the Dakars they have air conditioning, windshields. They do endurance racing, and um, so look for like oh, the older down there, ones. Rally Raid, go down, Zach. Right there. Yeah. Look for like the minis and stuff like that. Like the four wheel drive. Yeah, or something like that. Like that. And so these are highly capable off road vehicles, but with air conditioning. Not that the four runners and stuff don't. Yeah. But I wanted like a sports car feel off road. So like a Rally Plus. Yeah. So, um, and, just, and I wanted to also do a Toyota vehicle. And just somehow I found. This 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 Rav Four, and they came with a manual transmission, a five speed. There was also f- four wheel drive available, and uh, is this I, one four four wheel drive? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So for a moment there, in the first few years, they had manual transmissions and four wheel drive available, wow. and most of those went to mountain towns. So they're all rusted through and and kind of gone. But this was a Southern California car, and uh, uh, I mean, got, got it. I've with, never seen shorter overhangs on a yeah. vehicle. That I can think. It of. reminds me of like a Pajero Evo a little bit. A little bit. That's yeah. that's a dream car of mine, yeah. right? Is is that 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 philosophy, that build sure. philosophy? So independent suspension. Like there's a bunch of stuff that makes this car really fun on the road yeah. and the drive there. And you can even take some canyons and stuff and have fun driving it. And then when you get to off road, it also does off roading and 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 trails and all that. So stuff what did well. you do to modify it other than bigger wheels and tires here? So we the suspension links are mostly stock. It has mm-hmm. a good five link in the back and a McPherson in the strut or in the, a McPherson in the front. The rear shocks are a Bilstein uh, bypass shock for a Toyota Tundra. Okay. Wow. And we built different brackets and stuff to to mount that in there. So it has nine and a half inches of travel in the rear. Okay. <laughs> so nine and a half is pretty good. Yeah. The front, uh, nobody makes anything uh, of. That at the level that I wanted, so uh, they have these uh, Bilstein uh, rally shocks, rally struts that have a, um, a housing on it that you weld your own ears and tabs to. Oh, okay. So a, a guy, a Doug, uh, Streetwise down here in California, in Southern California, built me a custom set of them with the overall length and stuff that was set up for the eight inches of travel on the front. Nice. And then we installed them on the front. So it has basically motorsport dampers on it. Um, is the powertrain yeah. left alone? So for a while, I used the stock 2.2, but yeah. now it has a 2-liter 3S GTE engine, what they call like the Gen is that the, 5. The, the Japanese engine? Yeah, it's yeah out the of a, JDM one? Yeah, it's out of a Toyota Caldina. Yeah, yeah. But very you similar. Those in MR2s. Totally. Yeah. The guy that did the swap for me does MR2 swaps. Oh, yeah, Yeah, cool. Lewis. Shout, shout out to Lewis. Yeah. yeah. That, I bet that's fun. Was this recently? February twenty fourth. Oh yeah, it's up up a snowy Angeles. Crest. Uh, I like your WRX uh, STI hood scoop now. <laughs> yep. So Saivon makes that thing, yeah. and it's yeah. <laughs> I had a, the best comment is you know Subaru called the monster hood scoop back. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I That's tried to not have cool. it, but I needed it because it has a top matter intercooler. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's probably helpful. It looks, it looks great. really cool, man. Yeah, I bet what it's a fun. fun thing. Oh, so much fun! It has a stock uh, center locking diff. If somebody oh. wanted to build, uh, would wanted to build their own, could you give them the specs for the suspension and whatever? Or is it proprietary? No, I actually have a YouTube video where I profiled oh, what we did. Oh, okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Go look at Steph's YouTube channel, and uh, you can. That's such fun. You can get that. Uh, that thing rules. Um, 
Wyatt B. Wyatt B. says, uh, "What is it that makes the B fifty eight so strong and powerful that it can blow up an intake manifold and still keep its rods inside?" <laughs> So the first year that we were running the Supra with the B-58, at one of the events, we did blow up our 3D printed intake manifold. Uh, but we did have a, it was due to an electronics issue, and it made the timing go off at the wrong time, and the nitrous and everything blew up the intake manifold, and intake backfired and, and blew that whole thing up. Oops. Yeah. But what's interesting is we actually repaired that 3D printed intake manifold, and that's what we use on Jonathan Castro's car all last season with zero problems. Oh, okay. So it was it was our fault. Um, but uh, So yeah. it wasn't the, the incident that this person is referring to. Nothing really happened inside the motor that would have caused the rods to blow. Yeah, the timing went off. The timing, the spark plug, it lit the mixture while the intake valve was still open. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And so it blew it, back. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Oops. Um, <laughs> Philip LaFranca, I kind of asked this question already, but the second part might be interesting. I know there was some thought to bring empirical data to the scorekeeping. But I wasn't sure if that made it to pro level drift or if that would ever happen. Do you have any thoughts on empirical data versus judging? So there's always a debate on uh, is a judge sport? Is it really a motor sport? And people really debate whether somebody won or lost that round. And there, you know, people argue that they should bring in some, you know, empirical data. So sensors and stuff, how close you are to the wall and how much angle you have. After thinking about this for many years now and different debates I've had with different friends, I think that the ambiguity of some of the decisions and different people thinking of different directions and then going out on social media and commenting and and mother effing like the series and the judges and all that stuff is part of the sport. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Sometimes your favorite driver doesn't win and sometimes uh, you get robbed and sometimes it goes the other way. And it's the same thing in a lot of sports. You know, if you're watching basketball and maybe they think it was a foul and it wasn't and they go back later and they realize that the, the, the ref made the wrong call, that's just part of it. And hopefully that the universe, you know, equals itself out. And if you get some bad calls, you also get some good ones. But overall, I think uh, I, I don't think it's a problem, even though people are yelling it's a problem. Mm hmm. Um, Sean, we already kind of answered your question for somebody else about they want to get into developing a racing team and race car development company. I think the advice is probably to build your own car. Start with that. Yeah. I'm, or go to work for somebody else's team. This is the challenge and is, it seems, I mean, motorsports is, <laughs> for most of its time has been a, you know, a gentleman sport. And in most racing series, you know, from SCCA and NA, uh, NASA and all the stuff, and most of NHRA, it's a gentleman sport where you go out and you spend money and you go racing, whether it's, you know, rallies and stuff like that. And they're at the top level, there's there's a pro racing. And the route to pro racing, um, I mean, I, I can only tell you my route, which was I happened to be into import drag racing stuff when it was just being popular and happened to build something that was competitive at a time when there was a lot of attention on it and you know did a lot of networking and had a lot of friends in the industry and was able to start getting some sponsors and 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 built and evolved my entire you know business along with the whole industry i think it's a much more challenging now because now you have an established industry yeah. and to try to break into that is more expensive and you have to do bigger more exciting things yeah but, you have to be like amazing. You have to like do your own thing and be so good at it that people can't ignore you. But if you if you you can, I can make some, I can think of some people that have done that again now. So you talked about uh, Adam LZ, mm -hmm. right? So he did his YouTube stuff for many years, and he was he he is a very popular YouTuber. But he's also really into cars, and he was starting to do some local competitions and started becoming a better driver, and then started doing some of the form of the drift stuff. And now he just announced he's racing with uh, Von Gittin's team with Ford uh, as a factory program in Formula Drift. So he was able to, to come up through the uh, influencer direction. Yeah. The other way is to get very, very rich and just play. That's most of the way. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, always, I keep saying, like, I mean, get, make, go make a lot of money doing anything else and I mean, then spend also, it on cars. You know, you like, also, we know people that. They they got a job at a shop, either they were a fabricator or they co-founded the shop or they were some they whatever their skill set was, and they learned a lot at that shop and then they split off to either do something that was more niche, 
like in that industry or run their own shop entirely. So you can also do that. That's right. There's, it's there's hard, many. Hard, I don't, right? I, 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 <laughs> if there, there isn't really a formula for it, um, you've got to figure out where your niche is and what you're really good at, and be good enough that someone will pay you to do it. Yeah, yeah. Be, you could also be, just be get yourself to be great at one very specific thing, like um, our our new friend Mitch from M Engineering. You know mm-hmm. that guy is just great at tuning, and now he's got his his business is everything from street cars to drag cars to Pikes Peak cars to factory race support for Porsche, mm-hmm. and he's just a guy. And he I mean, didn't have a CS degree. He, and he, he learned on the job at Cobb just a guy. and did it for long enough, but learned enough to then go and do his own thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jason says, "Why don't you sell Papadakis Racing merch? <laughs> FD fans want it." Merch business sucks, dude. But you do. <laughs> uh, no, I've, I've got some stuff right. listed on there, and I have done a couple of runs of, of shirts. But honestly, it's not our business, and um, it's – I may I drop some clothing in the future. It's a pain in the ass. But it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's so many better ways to make money than stupid merch. I'd rather win a championship yeah. than uh, sell a shirt. Yeah, yeah. let me this, – this is what it is. It's, it's, I've got to split my time between running the program – and family, and some things don't make it in. Sounds like a job for Jen Horsey. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Jen. Uh, Prashan, any interest in EV drifting? There's, it, yes. It seems like there should be some because it is high torque, high power, low duration is what EVs are good at. I definitely have interest in EV drifting. I think it'd be really fun and challenging to try to build a competitive EV car. I don't think we want a whole field of those things, because. Mm. Uh, but I think that if you have a, a couple of those cars in the sport, it would be add some excitement to it. Uh, but at the at this moment, um, no one's approached me, uh, including Toyota, with any interest in spending the amount of money it would take or putting the resources uh, that it would take to develop a competitive EV vehicle. It's definitely something that someone could do for fun, you know, and you could probably, if you if you were capable of building any EV converted car, you could build an EV drift car. It's not like there's something holding you back, like there's Tesla motors available and battery packs available, like one could do it. But also, you there's it would require a lot of trackside support to keep that thing charged up between runs. You know, require a huge generator. It wouldn't be clean. You'd be running a huge fucking semi-sized generator. Um, this is from a few years ago. I think Travis Reeder drove this electric uh, Camaro. Oh yeah, nicknamed Freedom One. Eat a dick. These people are so fucking unoriginal with their with this dumb freedom stuff. Uh, okay, well it it does exist. Oh, they you know they were trying to show off. They had a they had this thing that was like a drop in crate. EV mm-hmm. powertrain that was supposed to fit where you could fit an LS engine. That was the idea. And it would bolt on to the bell housing so you could still have a, a manual gearbox. So, yeah, possible. But They, they had a oh, Tesla powertrain in that. Oh, did they? Yep, oh, in okay. the back. Yeah. Oh, all right. Did and you it, ever see it run? Yeah, yeah, did yeah. It, did it? Was it good? It drifted, but it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't competitive. Okay. And I think the resources that they would have needed to take it to the next level, uh, they just weren't willing to invest. Yep. Okay. Uh, Tom has the last question, but we pretty much covered it uh, earlier about engine swaps and uh, going from building drag cars to building drift cars and what skills apply. Thank you to our patrons. We appreciate your questions today. Uh, the Papadakis Racing YouTube channel has a lot of really good stuff on it. Uh, the, the the barn find and restoration, the RAV4 stuff, the Supra engine build, all that good shit. Like and subscribe. Hit the little bell. Someone today, Zach, said that they got a notification that they couldn't hit the bell on our channel because we had labeled videos as kid-friendly. I have not labeled any videos as kid friendly. I don't know what I that means. I always say no yeah. when they ask. I don't know. Uh, I'll go and look in our back catalog. Weird. But uh, do you do you watch your YouTube numbers? Do you really care? I care, but I don't watch them. I watch them when I put out a new video mm-hmm. to see what's happening, mm-hmm. um, especially the first hour or two. I've I've 
I don't remember. It's been a while, but I, I think I uploaded something and I was like, oh my God, there's a major error I put in there and I took it off yeah. and I had to re- 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 change, it, change it and put it back on. I think maybe that happened once. Yeah, that'll happen once in a while. Yeah. Make enough videos, so you'll get used to it. <laughs> yeah, but, but after that, um, no, I don't watch it. I don't respond to the comments. Um, I let the it sort of work itself out. And then uh, I read them once in a while. And fortunately, they're almost entirely positive. Mm-hmm. So I'm really, really, really fortunate with that. Uh, so, um, but but not much, no. My, my focus is really on the team. I like putting out content when I can, but honestly, uh, it got to the point where it was like, man, I don't want to film my life. And uh, and then I talked to, you know, TJ Hunt a little bit and Adam LZ and, and some of these folks that are on like that YouTube treadmill where they need to keep putting out content in order to keep the algorithm happy and i was young like man's game yeah and i was like that's not what i do yeah um so i I'd, I'd like to come out with a video a month and i probably have enough stuff we're doing to do that uh but i don't and um yep let it be what it be yeah that's a good that's a good that's a good place to be and not not have it run too much of your life because the, the, those guys who i mean they, they work really hard and that's their gig and but like, God, it's ex- fucking exhausting. I have so many masters in my life. Uh, with <laughs> no, I, 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 like when you have a, a series, like you need to be there at that event. You need to be competitive. Like you can't turn your homework in late. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like that's the basis. Like everything kind of goes on. Then we've got these multiple cars, and then you know when you have a business you're running, and all of these things that rely on uh, being me being reliable. Yeah. To having another one where I have some content that I've got to put out all the time, uh, it, it, it's not a good, uh, that's not how I want to live my life. So, and I'm fortunate enough to be in a position where I can choose those things. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good man. Priorities in order. Mm-hmm. Thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it. Um, go follow Stefan all the places you follow him, right? Instagram and, and, uh, and follow that YouTube channel and wave high when you see him at the Formula Drift Paddock with those three cars. And uh, I can't wait to see what you keep doing, man. Always love talking to you. See you up on Newcomb's Ranch in the hill Fridays. Um, is there still snow up there? The road's clear yet? Probably more now. It's raining. Oh, shit, it is. Yeah, it's probably getting worse. We yeah, can't go up rain there. It's supposed to rain today tomorrow. Can't go up there for a little while. It's going to be snowing again. Damn. I, I've been looking at the road conditions on the Caltrans website. Uh-huh. And it's closed past like uh, nine mile or whatever oh, that is. Oh, is it? Is. Yeah. Okay. Damn. Dude, get snow tires for the Ferrari. <laughs> It's got big sidewall. It's mid-engine. I went up there with the Safari 911. Remember? Yeah. A couple years ago. It was fun. I know. Yeah, Dude, it was kick thing. ass. Come on. I'm buying snow Come tires on. for fucking Ferrari. Waste of money. He'll tell us in the I'd RAV4. Use it, use it once. Uh, that RAV4 seems fun, though. I'd like to have a go in that. That looks cool. Yeah, the next time we come up, I'll, I'll uh, bring it up. And that's a good, around. Yeah, it's a good time, that thing. I love, I'm into that. That might have to be. Those are going to I feel like those are going to be collectible because they're just not. They just don't exist. Yeah, they're really I mean, your cool. approach angle is like better than most Wranglers. It's got to be. It's just. I've, I, I, I've, there's a couple. Like, I went to King of Hammers this big off road festival mm-hmm. thing like, last year, and there's a couple old timer guys that you know they're in their you know jeeps and all this stuff, and they're like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> and then they saw me go up some of the hills and down some of the stuff, and like one of them came over. He's like, "Dude, I thought this thing was super silly." He's like. It's totally won me over. Like, yeah. this cool. thing's amazing. Yeah, it looks Here's great. So, yeah. I love tiny little off-road cars. They're great fun. Yeah. Thanks for coming. We'll see you later. I'll see you guys tomorrow with Mike Spinelli at, uh, what, 2 p.m. Pacific? I think Might so. Be. It's, either, it's either 2 or 3 p.m. Pacific. Zach will make the event. Patrons, we'll see you there. Bye.